Hello everybody, my name is Elliot Newton and I'm the Biodiversity Officer for Kingston Council and thank you so much for joining us this evening for this virtual presentation about the work that has been going on at Tolworth Court Farm. Um, you can see the number of partners that are involved in this project at the top of the screen here. Um, I'll let them introduce themselves um, uh, in, in a moment as we, after we go through the agenda. Um, but one organisation that I will make a, a note of at this point is uh, the GLA, the Greater London Authority, through the Mayor of London, who have been funding all the work uh, that has been taking place uh, on Tolworth Court Farm this year. And hopefully, uh, over the next or well, 45 minutes or so, you'll get a real understanding about what we've been doing, and um, and then there'll be plenty of time for questions at the end. Um, ben, is it okay if you uh, jump to the next slide? Thank you very much. Fantastic. So let me just uh, uh, run through how we'll be running this virtual event this evening. So as I say, in a moment, I'll pass over to our fantastic community partners, uh, the Community Brain and Citizen Zoo, to give an instruction uh, uh, about them. Um, and then we'll give you an introduction to the site, Tolworth Court Farm, just in case some of you might not have been there in the past, or some of you may have been there, but might not be aware of some of its history, uh, which is great. And then we'll give you a bit of context about what rewilding is, because it's, it's quite a strange term, and it means a lot of things to a lot of different people. So we'll give some background about that, and also what it could potentially mean in this, in this context. Uh, and then we'll give you more of an introduction to what's been going on um, over the course of the last sort of year or so, which has incorporated free work streams through our ecological surveys, our feasibility investigations, and our community engagement work. Then we'll take a moment or two to just look at possible options for the future. One thing to, to make very clear at this early stage, nothing is confirmed at this stage. We're just purely assessing options, we're getting people's opinions, bringing that all together to try and create this co-designed vision for the site to enable it to maximize its ecological and social potential. So um, yeah, so we're very much in that journey and in that journey together. So thank you all for being part of it this evening. Um, and yeah, uh, as I said at the end, it'll be time for questions. And there's a, um, I'm sure many of you are familiar with, with the Zoom process by now, but we, we've got a Q and A function down below. So if you do have any burning questions, uh, please do get them on, uh, and we'll uh, do our best to answer them at the end of the uh, presentation this evening. Um, so uh, with no further ado, I'll, I'll, I'll pass over to, to Robin from the Community Brain. So over to you, Robin, and if we go to the next slide, Ben. Thank you. Yeah, good evening, everybody, and thank you very much for joining. I'm going to speak for a brief moment about the Community Brain. We're a not-for-profit organisation based <coughs> in the borough of Kingston. Um, and what we're really about is how do we work with people, individuals and communities to really enhance and make the best of where we live. Uh, and some of you will know our work through perhaps some of the, I'm going to say, zany events that we do, like Surbiton Ski Sunday and the Seething Freshwater Sardine Festival. But we also run uh, the Surbiton Food Festival, um, and we have a number of uh, spaces in the borough that do um, community work, and in particular at the moment focused around food poverty um, and trying to ensure there are some warm spaces. Um, but in relation to um, Tolworth, we've been working on a project that started off called Shedex, and that was about how do we counter the proposition that the Evening Standard and others put out that Tolworth, in their words, was the scrag end of the Royal Borough of Kingston upon Thames, when in fact it's filled with really rich stories and some amazing people. And we've focused on a number of those over the last two or three years, including the fact that David Bowie first performed as Ziggy Stardust at the Toby Jug. We've looked at the history and heritage of Corinthian Casuals, the local football club of Mr Middleton, who was absolutely instrumental and encouraging a nation to turn to gardening and grow vegetables. And then Tolworth Court Farm Fields, which was, is this amazing open space that when we did our initial surveys before COVID, 95% of local residents were completely unaware that it was there because of the way the A3 acts as such a, a massive divider in the community. Um, and we think it's the most beautiful place with amazing potential. Um, and that's why we're excited about the opportunities that this project could bring. Ben. Brilliant. Thanks, Robin. 
Uh, so good, good evening, everyone. My name is Ben. And I work for Citizen Zoo. I'm the Urban Rewilding Officer. Um, some of you may be familiar with our work, but uh, working locally, well, we're a conservation organisation. I um, should start with, uh, we have a specific focus on rewilding, and we do this primarily through uh, community-led habitat restoration and species reintroduction projects. So many of you may be aware of our waterfowl reintroduction project, uh, which as of August of this year, released over 100 waterfowls back onto the Hogsmoor River, um, where they've been locally extinct uh, since 2017. The community-led project, we've had over 300 volunteers getting involved to date, um, with everything from surveying the river right through to habitat restoration, helping us actually fundraise for the waterfowls themselves. Um, and, and, and now monitoring the river for um, invasive species and also the waterfalls themselves. So take, undertaking several different surveys out on the river. Um, slightly further afield, we are working currently on a beaver reintroduction project. So this is in Healing, um, looking at a site called Paradise Fields, where we're hoping to reintroduce um, beavers to, to showcase the incredible kind of uh, abilities of the animal, these animals to create wetland, wetland habitats that can sequester carbon, uh, prevent flood, flooding further downstream, filter pollutants, um, and various ecosystem services. Uh, we also want to use, use it as a kind of springboard for a large amount of community engagement, um, trying to get Londoners and people in urban areas used to living alongside these animals in the hope that one day um, we'll see them back in the capital, kind of wild spread across the capital once again. Uh, even further afield, we work on a grasshopper reintroduction project. So this is a species called the large marsh grasshopper, um, which is the UK's largest but rarest species of grasshopper. And uh, once widespread throughout the south of, of England, it's now it was as of 2018, it was only found in three locations in the southwest. Every year, we run a project where we get local people in the area of Norfolk um, to home rear grasshoppers. So we give them the equipment they need, the training they need. Um, to, to go ahead and home rear grasshoppers for a period of two months. And using that kind of methodology and um, uh, you know, that, that method, we've successfully released over 4,000 individuals up into the wild across four sites in Norfolk, which is an incredible achievement. Um, coming back uh, closer to home in Kingston, we also work on an area of, kind of rewilding people. We have a specific focus on um, engaging local people. We do this through a couple of projects, uh, one being our Edith Gardens Nature Reserve, which is a small nature reserve um, in, near Berryland, um, which we've restored back from, well, we've completely restored it, and it's, you know, the borough is only fully accessible nature reserve, and we're now running ecotherapy sessions on that site with the local branch of MIND um, and organisations like the Kingston Centre for Independent Living. Um, and also in Kingston as well, we're working with the Kingston Carers Network, um, specifically with their young carers on a project called the Curiosity Project. We were taking out children as young as eight to around about 15 years of age, um, giving them respite from their caring duties, taking them out to local nature reserves, and getting them to experience the local wildlife. Um, it's been a really great project. So I will hand back over to Elliot now. Great. Thank you, Ben, and thank you, Robin, for that great insight. Give you a snippet insight to your to, to your organisations and the work that you've been up to. So now the focus of the evening, of course, is Tolworth Court Farm. That's why you've joined us. So uh, let, let's get on with the main event. So Tolworth Court Farm, hopefully the first thing to say is that I hope many of you might have been there on your daily walks or uh, adventures traveling locally because it is an absolutely fantastic space uh, and it already is, is a habitat for so many species. So what I'm going to do over the next sort of uh, five minutes or so is hopefully introduce you to the site uh, we've got the historical context as well as a bit of an ecological baseline and I'll pass on to Ben who'll give you some more detail on the ecological surveys that have been happening. So Ben if you just jump to the next slide for me uh, quickly. Thank you. Yeah, so here it is. Uh, so it's that, it's that area marked in red there. And out of all 12 Kingston Nature Reserves, it's by far our largest. It's about 42 hectares in size. So an incredibly uh, large space when it comes to uh, compared to some of the other green spaces that we have locally. But it's not only Tolworth Court, si uh, Tolworth Court Farm size that is important from an ecological perspective. It is its connectivity with the wider landscape. And this map sort of shows it relatively clearly. So to its southern border there, we've got the Hogsmill River. And the Hogsmill River is an incredibly important wildlife corridor. It's an area in which wildlife can commute back and forth. But also in itself, it's an internationally rare habitat. It's a, what we call a chalk-fed stream. It rises 
in uh, uh, born born hall in Espanyol and travels 9.9 .9 kilometers uh, uh, through Espanyol and into the heart of Kingston. And it is very important for our ecological networks that we have within the borough. And as I say, Tolworth Court Farm is situated right on the banks of the Hogsmill and one of its tributaries, the Bonesgate. And hopefully you can sort of see it from this map. There, there is a green ribbon, a, a fantastic band of green space that has survived uh, hundreds, if not thousands of years of human presence. And uh, that there makes it a really incredibly important wildlife corridor. So by having that ecological connectivity, uh, it is so important to sort of recognize the, the, the importance of this space at a landscape level. And then we sort of work to promote and encourage that ecological connectivity, but also by any sort of positive uh, conservation actions that take place at Tolworth Court Farm will hopefully not only help Tolworth Court Farm in isolation, they will percolate into the wider landscape and be able to create a more ecological functional system. So I hope that gives you a good idea of, 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 of where it is. Uh, just even an idea, it's just south of the A3 here, the other side of, um, of the A3 from, from, Tol from Tolworth Tower. And I'm sure Robin can uh, talk more about that, maybe in the question and answer sessions about how the barrier that that, 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 that is currently and, and how having this site might actually promote more people to explore and get involved and we reconnect to our natural landscape that we have locally. You can jump to the next slide for me, Ben, that'd be great. So this is a lovely aerial photo that was taken of the site. And I think it depicts it um, pretty, pretty, pretty well. We have what here to the north, we have, uh, that is Jubilee Way. And then to the, the, uh, the, the east there, we have um, the A240. So there's sort of two roads that border the site. And to the south of the site, or past the Hogs Mill, that is Surrey. So we're sitting right on the boundary of Greater London here. But if you look more at the site, we can see it's comprised of seven field systems. Um, and they also have some really fantastic hedgerows that I'll briefly mention in a moment. And, uh, and sort of those meadows there and air compartments of woodland. But hopefully you can see from this, this picture that it is a vast space compared to some of our other green spaces. And that gives us a real opportunity to try and do some exciting conservation interventions to make it as ecological functionally as possible. Um, so you can just jump to the next slide again, Ben. That'd be great. So yeah, just, just to give you a bit more historical context, because I think it's so important uh, when you're doing any project, not only just to think about, you know, uh, well, from, from particularly my mindset as a biodiversity officer for Kingston, and, and uh, I, I tend to have sort of tunnel vision when it comes to ecology, but obviously it's, things are way more complicated than that. There's so much more fantastic history and social importance. So it's so important that we recognise and celebrate the social heritage of the site. And Tolworth Court Farm indeed has an incredible, uh, incredible history, as does so much of the areas around us. So just a few little points that I just want to raise, just to give you a small snippet of uh, insight to sort of the, the, the history of the area. So one of its most fascinating features, through its heart, through the, the, the heart of the, the site is almost dissected by an old Roman road, a road that would have taken Romans into the capital and it served as a very important highway, uh, you know, 2000 or so years ago. So the site was used even that far ago. So there's been a human presence on this site for a very long time. If you go forward about a thousand years to uh, the time of William the Conqueror and the Doomsday, um, the site indeed is, is mentioned in the Doomsday book when it was a large farm in the name of Taldor and it had a farming community there. It was, the farm was actually gifted uh, by um, uh, William the Conqueror to his guardian. So the site actually has like a direct relationship with William the Conqueror himself. And um, as I'm sure some of you are aware, the Serbiton and Tulf has quite an his, interesting history when it comes to the Civil War. And I believe um, uh, it, was, it was used at, at that time uh, to sort of uh, some sort of parliamentarian soldiers actually based there uh, before they went on one of their last sort of skirmishes, one of the last sort of battles that happened in the Civil War. So it's got a duck link with that too. So it's a really fantastic, interesting, um, well, yeah. Rich history that the site has, um, and then and that is also recognised in some of the names of the meadows. For example, um, one of the meadows, as you can see, is called Sawpit Meadow, and that's because you know for years and years the local woodlands that would have been brought, the wood would have been brought here and processed, and that's probably why it gets its name. Becoming more recent and more more modern day sort of living memory. Um, in, in 1989, that is when Kingston Council actually bought the site. They bought it from Lambeth Council, who actually had intentions to uh, turn the site into a, uh, a cemetery. 
uh, as many London in the London cities were looking places to bury their bury their their dead and looking at outer outer boroughs and sorry to do that. So that that's probably why they highlighted this as an option. But I was so pleased actually. In as I see, 1989, um, Kingston Council bought it from uh, Lambeth Council to prevent it being turned into a cemetery and, and maintain it as a, a natural space that can support species and, and wildlife. So that was very good forward thinking from my perspective. I think hopefully all of our perspectives that the site was protected at that point. Um, and then coming forward, even another sort of uh, a few uh, about ten years or so, um, the site actually has a history of. Um, uh, you know, some, some traveler in, in incursions and also there was a five-day rave that took part in the site which actually i speak to a lot of volunteers and i actually remember being part of maybe going to that rave so in a, in a way to try to, to sort of stop that um and sort of the, 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 those sort of potentially ecologically destructive behaviors the council in 2001 erected these huge bonds around the site so as you go to the site you'll as you walk through you'll be presented by these large mounds and they, they were erected in 2001 to, to, to try and prevent or vehicle access and trying to discourage um, sort of those damaging behaviours that, that, that took place then. And actually now they actually support quite an interesting ecology that I'll let Ben touch on in a little bit. And in terms of its protection, the site is of course protected. It's got some really important designations um, attributed to the land. One is it's what we call metropolitan open land. Uh, so that gives it the same sort of protection uh, as Greenbelt, it's sort of a London specific protection. Um, and also we have, it's called a site of importance for nature conservation, a sink for short, um, and it's borough grade importance. And also it's a local nature reserve, but as I say, one of our 12 that we have in the borough. And we'll just be aware there's got uh, two public right of ways. So the site will always be public accessible and that's something we want to promote and encourage sort of responsible use and access of the site so people can kind of try and access the site and connect to the amazing social and natural history that we have on our doorsteps. And, uh, and it's important to note that there are, of course, issues of the site. We do have quite a lot of, there are elements of antisocial behaviour in terms of still we get some fly tipping. You might have seen some of the litter that was dropped there just last week. So we do get some, 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 some issues like that. There is some level of, um, uh, uh, of, of a sort of antisocial behaviour that takes place and we do get quite a lot of um, uh, potentially sort of on ecologically friendly, uh, uh, non-nature friendly dog walking that happens on the site that can also be quite intimidating to non, uh, to other people. So there are a few social issues that hopefully as we promote this site, we can try and combat and make it a better site for both local people and also the wildlife that lives there. If you could jump to the next slide for me, Ben, that'd be great. Um, so as I say, I won't dwell too long on this, we'll just jump on to the next slide as well. Um, I won't dwell too long on this um, because Ben will give you a bit more detail of the stuff that we've been doing, but talking at a very sort of high level, the, the site supports um, sort of three main sort of habitat types, four if you want to really uh, 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 Go into it, but it has these big, those big meadows um, are sort of grassland dominated uh, um, uh, systems. We've got mesotrophic, sort of neutral grassland meadows dominated by a species like uh, coxfoot grass and foxfoot grass. And Ben will talk more about that that in a moment. Um, but uh, it has got a history of having some grazing on it, and it does have sporadic um, uh, fly grazing on it, which people might see as they use uh, as they walk around the site today. So those grasslands are probably one of the most dominant habitat types that the site has. It's also got these incredible ancient hedgerows or old uh, mature hedgerows that line the fields, which are species rich, incredible, incredible habitats in their own right. Uh, and they've been now managed actually since 1993 by the Lower Mole Trust, who are a fantastic local organisation who did lots of volunteering in the borough. They actually uh, were working in Southwood Nature Reserve just this week, so you might have seen them if you're walking around there. Um, and, they, and these, as I say, these, these, these hedgerows are very species rich. We've also, as I say, we're butted onto the, the, the Hogs Mill and the Bonesgate River, so we do have quite a lot of riverside habitat that is there as well. So that again is obviously a really important ecological feature that the site has. Um, so if you could jump onto the next slide for me, Ben. Um, again, again, I won't want to dwell too long onto this, but the site is, I just want to recognise it's really important at the moment for, for, for some species, such as butterflies. We know the site actually supports about half of the UK butterfly species fauna, and it's an incredible site. For, for, well, these are two particular species that Ben will go on to talk more about, but for example, these brown hair streaks, we know it's an incredibly uh, a great site for brown hair streaks. And thank you to the butterfly conservation volunteers who've been running their transects for the last five or six years on site, which gives us some really robust lepidoptera data. And also if you walk the walk on the site on a sunny day, uh, late summer, you might be, uh, you will most likely encounter one of these beautiful butterflies called a marbled white. 
sometimes we can see over 500 of them just in one day. So we know we know the site is good for butterflies at the moment, which, which is something we, we obviously uh, love to see and we, we want to promote and protect moving forward. If you don't want to say next slide for me, Ben. Obviously, there's, a, there's other species that use the site. Those of you that walk around almost certainly see the kestrels hovering above and all, as they search for the small mammals that are running around the field voles and such like that are running around the long grasses. So these are a common sight that we typically see when we walk around the site at the moment. Um, if you jump to the next slide for me, Ben. I feel like one of these COVID briefings, just uh, old school COVID briefing, asking you to do all the clicking. Um, but yeah, so just to give you a small insight to some of the conservation work that has the Kingston Council has been delivering um, over the last sort of two years or so. So there's a small component of the site that's just the other side of the A240 called the Tolworth Court Farm Moated Manor. And that held the manor house that was actually mentioned there in the Doomsday Book in 1086. And we now manage this site in a traditional way, uh, which is uh, really ecologically sensitive. So it's not great for, it's great for wildlife, but also helps to promote our, um, our, our natural heritage. Uh, and our social heritage as well. So just to give you a small idea, uh, for the last two years, we've been running scything workshops there, teaching people how to that traditional grass cutting method, and we scythe the grass, and obviously it's a very low carbon footprint, just so, you know, working on people power and sandwich power, as we scythe the, our scythe the landscape around the yellow meadow ant hills that are on that site which makes which make such a special ecological feature of that site so that's really better than driving a big diesel uh, tractor over all these poor ant mounds which uh, which would potentially destroy them some of them could be over hundreds of years old but by doing this side they have a very low carbon footprint but also ecologically sensitive little animals can get out of the way and also we can avoid damage to the um uh, uh, uh to the and mounds themselves. Um, and, and then following our scything, we then bring these lovely cattle onto the site. Three, well, this year we had three Sussex cattle that we get from the North Down, the, the Downlands Grazing Partnership. And we, we have, we've had over a hundred people helping and support our cattle grazing over the last two years. And um, these cattle are called aftermath cattle and they use their long tongues to do their fantastic conservation grazing, which helps to increase the biodiversity and sward structure and potential uh, floristic diversity of these meadows. Uh, so they really are a fantastic um, attribute to the conservation plan of this site. And uh, yeah, people are always surprised that even now we have, uh, for at least a month of the year, we have cows in Tolworth, which always uh, is, well, is normally very well received and we it's great thank you so much to all the volunteers who've made it possible to get to this point at this stage because it's been a long time uh, coming to getting that management plan and it wouldn't have happened without all the support of the community and this one last thing i'll tell you about the small site here working obviously with the community brain and citizen zoo and kingston university we um we, we built this fantastic nature watching hide that um, is a fantastic asset which as, as ben mentioned the kingston young carers will regularly go there when they do their nature trips and also it's a great place to sit and watch wildlife locally. It just shows you how we can embrace um, interesting architecture as well as nature onto these sites, which have a real functional value. Um, but yeah, so just to give you some idea of some of the stuff that's been happening on the smaller site, uh, but uh, hopefully paving the way for some of the work we might be able to do on the larger site. Thank you, Ben, and mm -hmm. um, on to the next slide. So we mentioned the word rewilding and rewilding is an interesting phrase. Um, it actually means a lot of things to a lot of different people. It's actually a word that was sort of originated in the early 90s in the American context by a chap called Sol and Nos, or two chaps. And it, it, in the first instance, they used it to talk about um, uh, huge American landscapes where you have these huge vistas. And their intention was there that these three seas, so these huge land, swathes of land, create these huge corridors and these huge cores, these great valuable large tracts of land that could be which were missing carnivores so what they did what they did in sort of the, sort of the Yellowstone context they introduced uh, uh, wolves into the system and that helped to uh, enable ecological processes to take place and create a functional ecosystem which could be self-managing and, uh, and and lots of research has come out of that about how ex biodiversity has exploded by enabling these trophic cascades to take place and allowing nature to some extent to take the wheel of uh, using its millennia of evolution to sort of uh, control how, how we can create these biodiverse rich habitats but of course i'm not suggesting that we reintroduce wolves to somewhere uh, anytime soon, that's for sure. So we obviously rewilding in an urban sense means a very different, um, uh, a very different thing. 
Um, one, one thing I suppose we want to know in, in a rural context, we're seeing lots of rewilding projects happen in the UK at the moment, which is fantastic. But sometimes in a rural setting, rewilding can bring um, people in conflict with farmers, for example, who might be a bit uh, scared or not scared, a bit um, dubious of what these, what this, what, what this what word might mean to, to, to their livelihoods and, and uh, their local land management. But what we find more in the urban context, we talk to people about rewilding, it actually engenders hope and excitement. It's like, oh, how can we try and breathe life back into our into our landscapes? How can we try and engage the 84% of people who live in the urban environment within the UK context, connect them back to nature? And can we try and rewild our spaces to, 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 um, to, to uh, have a more functional ecosystem? So in our context, this is how we try and define it. If you jump to the next slide, Ben. So we, we've taken four, four, four sort of things here that we think is how rewilding might be applied to, to the Tolworth Court Farm setting. One thing is, as I say, embracing ecosystem processes, ecological processes, allowing, a fun, allowing an ecosystem to, to be able to move and be in flux. So, uh, nature is dynamic and how can we embrace that dynamic nature? Not locking it down in one particular sort of ecological state and not allowing it to change, uh, sort of locking it down in succession. We wanted to be able to sort of breathe as a landscape and be able to function. Um, and one way of achieving that might be able to use analog species. And we'll talk about what that might mean um, at the end of the presentation. We, of course, want to try and maximise its ecological value. How can we make Tower Court Farm as good as it can possibly be to support as rich biodiversity and fauna and flora as possible? I think one of the most important things, if not the most important thing on this project is rewilding people, how we can try and engage people to reconnect with nature and get all the benefits that can bring from a, a physical and mental well-being perspective and also feel proud about where we live and how, how rich our nature can be living alongside and thriving alongside wildlife. I think sites like Tolcourt Farm really have that potential to deliver those really important social outcomes as well. Robin said at the start of this talk when they did their survey before COVID, very few people even knew this site existed. So how can we try and raise the profile of our natural heritage and encourage people to engage with nature in a responsible way that can bring so many benefits? And what we'll talk about now is ecological monitoring expert uh, 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 part. And any conservation project should have ecological monitoring. It's so important to how we um, uh, can monitor change over time. And uh, uh, so uh, and without that, if you don't monitor something, you can't manage it. So it's so important that we're able to know what's going on on site. And we'll hopefully we'll convince you this evening we've done some really fantastic ecological surveys to get that understanding. Uh, ben, can you show us the next slide? So I'm now going to actually pass you over to Ben, uh, who's going to take you through some of the work streams that we've been doing. Just to let you know, there's three work streams that I sort of alluded to at the start of the talk. One is our ecological monitoring, the most comprehensive ecological, ecological surveys that the site has seen, certainly in recent years, if not ever. And then our sort of feasibility investigations. And then I'll jump on at the end to talk a bit about our sort of community consultation efforts. But Ben, over to you. Brilliant. Thanks, Elliot. Um, so yeah, as Elliot's just mentioned there, our first work stream is looking at ecological surveys, trying to build up a really robust data set or, or baseline data set of the site. Um, we've done this in a few different ways, but um, the first of which being kind of using traditional survey methodologies, uh, looking at various different groups. But for example, we have contracts and services of uh, Peter Kirby. So Peter Kirby is a national invertebrate expert. He literally wrote the book on habitat management for invertebrates. So it's fantastic to get him out on site over the summer months to, to run some surveys. We've also contracted the services of Sarah Lambert. So Sarah Lambert is a botanical specialist, a plant specialist. Um, she ran UK habitat surveys on the site as well as NBC uh, grassland quadrats, which I will uh, go on to explain uh, shortly. Sarah has got well over 10 years working in Natural England um, and now currently heads up her own ecological consultancy. We've also worked alongside a local expert groups um, in the community, so Swords and District Bird Watching Society are going through running some surveys in this month, um, and also working alongside Busfire Conservation and more specifically Bill Downey, who's been, as Elliot mentioned earlier, has been running uh, along with several volunteers, many of which may be on the call tonight, running uh, surveys on the site for about five or six years. 
So these photos here were taken back in May of this year. So that was when the Peter and Sarah went out for their first survey day. As you can see, the grass is looking quite lush and green, which was very much not the case on their, their second and third visits over the summer month. Um, so yeah, just think, I think it's important to point out the kind of difficult conditions um, that they were surveying in, but um, nevertheless, they managed to get some incredible data set and built up, so I'll come on to that shortly. So we've got some initial results back from both um, Peter and Sarah. And so this map here is a really important one. So this is from Sarah. Uh, it might look slightly confusing, but this is basically a map to show your different habitat communities using the NBC community uh, survey methodology. So essentially what this does is Sarah went out, she took out quadrats into each of the fields. Uh, threw them on the ground and then surveyed for each specific plant species found in that quadrat. Using that uh, set of species, you can then identify what specific plant community you have on that site. As you can see here, up on the right hand side on the, the labels, a lot of the, the fields are showing MG, MG qualities, which stands for mesotrophic grassland, um, the bulk of which being MG1A, which is a typically fairly species poor grassland community is uh, synonymous with post arable fields um, so uh, they've been semi improved so they've had some level of fertilizer in the past so not unsurprising on on a site of this nature um, typically dominated by grass species so things like uh, coxfoot false oak grass and in particular yorkshire fog is found in high numbers as well Interestingly, fields uh, 4 and 5B, which you can see on the map here, show traits of MG1E, which have a slightly higher botanical diversity with species like Oxide Daisy and Meadow Bexley. Um, and Elliot mentioned earlier those bonds that were put in by the council in 2001. Really interesting on the kind of northern tip of the site uh, where those bonds stand. They were also showing characteristics of the MG1E e community. Um, which I think just goes to show it's quite interesting how um, these kind of uh, mini habitats can, can, or ecosystems can develop over time. Um, the, the most botanically interesting or diverse uh, field by far was field three in the bottom corner there. So this showed traits of MG5 community. So having a higher botanical diversity and uh, plant species like nap, uh, common nap weed, bird first, trefoil, and crested dog's tail. What's quite interesting about this field uh, is this is actually the only field on the site that's had grazing in recent history. Um, the, it has unassisted grazing from uh, the local traveling community. Um, and I think added with the fact that Sarah, in one of her recommendations for one of the ways we can increase, increase plant diversity on site is through extensive grazing. I think that um, with that kind of fact there is quite an interesting finding in itself. So of all the, the plant species that she recorded on site, there was actually only one nationally scarce species found, which was the yellow vetching that you can see here, a rather beautiful plant species. It has suffered a 30% decline in its range um, in recent decades. And it does have a record on Tolkien Farm Fields. It was found there back in 2011. So it's really great to see that it's surviving there today as well. In terms of the invertebrate surveys that we've had back, so we've had some initial findings. They've been, I think, really, you know, really positive. So Peter got back to us and he's found uh, 1,937 records. Um, and of those records, there were 780 individual species recorded. And I think what's quite incredible uh, of those individual recorded species, 44 of those have a formal conservation classification, and there's some examples here. So in the top left, we've got the white-banded longhorn beetle. So this is a species of beetle that you'll find on, uh, typically on the forest floor. In the daytime, scouring about, looking for bits of deadwood and detritus to, to munch up. Um, and again, yes, this is an actually scarce species. In the top right, it's got one of my favorites from the uh, species he's found. This is a large-headed resin bee. A uh, species of solitary bee that feeds all but exclusively on yellow headed daisy flowers, which you can see in the image here. And um, it's called the uh, resin bee because it's a it's a it burrows into into trees and it will actually use the, the resin of trees to seal up its individual cells once it's laid an egg, which I think is quite incredible. 
In the bottom left, we've got the brown tree ant. So this is a species of ant that lives exclusively or almost exclusively in the tree, in trees. As with lots of ant species, a large amount of this diet is from uh, farming aphids, which they will, um, they will massage in a way that actually helps them to uh, secrete something called honeydew, which is essentially just um, sap, which they've taken from plants they've been eating on. Um, and this is another one of the scarce species found on the site. And in the bottom right corner, we've got the brown hair street butterfly, which you know Elliot touched upon earlier. And we know Tolstor Farm Fields has got an incredibly strong population um, of these species. We know this from the extensive butterfly surveys that have been going on site over, over the recent years. I think what's really important to point out on in this species in particular was that uh, Peter said when he was doing kind of routine sweet netting on site, he was actually finding larvae of this species, which he said he's never found on any other site. Um, he surveyed before, which just goes to show what an incredible population that we have on Tolf Court Farm Fields um, and something that we need to make sure that we're protecting and enhancing going into the future with any management plans that we have in store. So in addition to the traditional kind of field survey techniques, we've also been using some fairly innovative methodologies for surveying species on site including using something called bioacoustics. And this is a fairly new area of ecological survey that essentially uses a sound recording device, which you can then match up all of those sound records of different animals and species to identify what species you have on site. So for this, we contracted the services of a really pioneering organization called Carbon Rewild. They essentially, they've got a, a really great model where you can essentially rent their equipment and they will send you out in the post all of their devices, which you can deploy in the field for a period of about a month. You then post them back to them and then they will analyze all of your, all of your results and will give you a really nice succinct uh, report and to, to let you know what you've got on site. Really kindly, they came, uh, came out to Tolfcourt Farm Fields to help us set up uh, survey devices. And we set five up across the site here, which you can see located at different locations. As you can see, notice we didn't record any less than 27 species at each of the five locations, which is quite incredible. And in total, we identified 45 unique species across 12 port farm fields. So this year is just a breakdown of the species we recorded. In total, there was 41 bird species, so right through from your more common species through to some um, less common, so things like sparrow hawks, barn owls, buzzards um, found on site. Um, we also recorded four species of bats, of, of mammals, sorry, including two species of bats and two species of shrew. So this is just a breakdown of, well, on the left, you've got the number of individual calls um, identified. So over 21,000 individual calls identified in just a month, which is quite incredible. You've also got a breakdown of the, the top five uh, most abundant bird species identified, so European robin, followed by Eurasian wren, great tit, blue tit, and rosewing parakeet. And then on the right, we've got a breakdown of the conservation status of those 41 bird species. So of those identified, four are listed on the red list, 12 on the amber list, and 25 on the green list. In addition to, to these surveys, we've also been running a series of community surveys. So these have been run in conjunction with the Bureau Studies Council as part of their BioLinks survey project. So the idea behind this is to get local people involved with actually building up our data set of the site. We, the, the way that they work is the field studies bring out some of the expert shooters in different taxonomic groups. So everything from earthworms, hornflies, spiders, right through to centipedes, millipedes, woodlife, and freshwater invertebrates. Their specialists come out, they teach skills in how to identify certain species out in the field and how to conduct some of these surveys. And all of this is feeding into our wider baseline data set for the site. To date, we've run five surveys and they've been incredibly well attended. We've had over 100 attendees come along um, and they've been really productive in terms of the species records that we've had as well. So on the top right, uh, not a particularly, uh, well, not a scarce species, but really incredibly on our first survey session, we identified uh, 23 different species of hobfly just in one day which um, the, the expert from the, from the day um, said was a really positive outcome in terms of for just one site, so that was brilliant. But we've also identified some, some more nationally scarce species. 
So on the top left, we've got the six belted clear wing moth, which is, well, as you can tell from its, its clear wings, that's where it gets its name. Really beautiful species of moth um, with really lovely um, black and yellow um, markings as well. On the bottom left, we got a uh, possibly the site's first ever record of a wasp spider. So a wasp spider gets its name from the way that it looks. So it actually mimics what the wasp looked like um, to evade predation. It's in, it's in fact not completely harmless um, to your eye, but um, really amazing, amazing species. Just like a garden spider, it creates orbed webs. Um, but you can tell the difference between this and a standard garden spider um, through a kind of zigzag, sh zigzag shape that they create in one corner of their web. Not actually a native species, it's colonised from the mainland um, in recent decades and it's starting to become uh, widespread throughout the south of England. So quite amazing to get our, our first record of this species on the site. And in the bottom right hand corner we've got uh, an, another naturally scarce species. So this is a species of centipede called Athenia vesuviana. It looks like quite a formidable beast. It can grow up to five centimetres and has uh, five pairs, uh, so up to 75 pairs of legs, uh, which is quite incredible as well. So in addition to all these surveys, we, we started to roll out uh, camera trap surveys on the site, primarily to build up our data set on different mammals using the site. So on the left hand side here, you can see some images of foxes. Um, we know that the Tolkien Farm Fields has records of roe deer on site, um, so it's been great with our first kind of round of surveys to get some uh, confirmed sightings of roe deer as well, which you can see on the right hand side here. And I should say, actually, we're going to continue doing these surveys um, over the coming months just to build up that data set on the different mammals using the site. So Elliot touched on this earlier, but in addition to all of our ecological surveys, we're also looking at the second work stream over the year, and this is our feasibility investigations. So this is very much about thinking about what we could potentially do on the site, and then thinking about how we could potentially make that, um, well, thinking about is that indeed viable, and then how we could actually bring that to life. So one of the key ways that we've been doing this is to, to have conduct site visits with uh, conservation experts from across the country and um, to get their insight on how best we can manage the site and get their um, you know, specialist insight. So on the top left hand side here you can see a uh, site visit with Derek Gow. So Derek Gow is kind of was pretty well renowned in the, in the conservation and rewilding world and um, perhaps best known for his species reintroductions. He's, he's behind releasing over 30,000 water bowls back into to the UK. He bred the water bowls for Citizen's Z water bowl reintroduction project, but also is working on other species such as white storks, uh, wildcats, and potentially even Eurasian lynx as well. He also heads up his own rewilded estate or, or farm down in on the Cornwall uh, Devon border called Queen's Head. Um, so he's got some great insight into yeah, how best, best to manage landscapes. On the top right here, we've got um, Sarah King. So Sarah King works for uh, Rewilding Britain. She heads up the Rewilding Network um, and is, in, is herself an expert in rewilding, but also it's been a great contact for putting us in touch with other practitioners who are working on similar sized projects. Um, so it was great to get Sarah down to site to get her insights, but also to help us connect up with other people working in the field as well. And in the bottom left, we've got Dominic Buskell. So Dominic Buskell works for Wild Ken Hill. You, many of you may be aware of Wildcat Hill as it's been, it's been the, the host site of uh, BBC Springwatch for the past few years. And they do some amazing things down there um, in terms of regenerative farming, traditional conservation um, uh, uh, management, as well as um, kind of pioneering rewilding methods as well, looking at uh, mixed grazing regimes. And then finally, we've also got um, George Monbiot here. So George Monbiot, he, you might know him as a Guardian columnist. He's also quite regularly on TV talking about environmental um, issues. He also wrote the book called Feral on Rewilding, which uh, to my mind really put uh, rewilding in the map in the UK um, as kind of a, as a, as a potential way of managing land um, throughout, throughout the UK. Um, so it's amazing to get George down and get his insights on Tolkien Farm Fields. I think one kind of recurring theme from all of these visits that we had was not just the potential in terms of the ecology of the site, 
but really how excited people were by the potential in terms of its level of engagement. Being an urban site with a huge catchment of local people, it really is kind of unique in its, in its way that it can potentially um, tap into local communities and get people excited about conservation, wildlife um, and rewilding more broadly as well. And then as part of these feasibility studies as well, um, we've also been looking into well, wetland investigations. So the image on the top left here, so that is a photo of what was or is the, the wetland component of the site. The, the, the very corner of the site does kind of remain wet generally for most of the year, particularly in the winter um, months, it, can get, it does get very wet. The summer we had though, it pretty much dried out um, fairly yeah. early on this summer. So we're looking at potential ways that we could enhance the wetlands so that we can have some level of standing water all year round, which will bring about a range of biodiversity benefits. So it's also important, important to point out here that um, not only would it be great in terms of uh, its implications for biodiversity, but also that corner of the site um, has been earmarked by the Environment Agency as part of their, um, uh, their flooding and risk assessments looking at as a, a, that location is a potential site that could hold water to try and alleviate flooding further downstream. Um, so that's one thing we're, we're also looking into. So to, to look into this work more, kind of more thoroughly, um, we've contracted the services of an organisation called 35%. So this is an organisation that's been working for decades now in the field of wetland creation and, and design. So they came out onto site in September to, to, to run some topographical surveys of the entire um, site, but also more specifically looking in that corner and um, where the wetlands uh, still exists to, uh, to take some soil analysis samples. And what they're really looking for here is how far down do you have to dig before you can get to that layer of um, landing clay below? Because that is essentially what we need to know in terms of how much soil would we need to take off um, so that we can get to that London clay that would then be enable us to, to hold water on site all year round. And what they'll be doing is they'll be going away and uh, looking at these soil analysis, taking away, looking at their topographical surveys and coming up with some potential designs that they can implement on site. So this could involve um, an offline system. So um, I don't know if Enid mentioned earlier, but um, the hogs will actually used to run through that corner of the site. So one of the things that we're looking at is potentially could we even read over the hogs will back through the site so that it's um, um, uh, yeah having kind of ongoing water going through that. Um, and what benefits that would could that bring about in terms of uh, filtering off potential pollutants from uh, the water upstream, um, and how, what implications that would have in terms of benefits for the biodiversity as well. Also looking to create potentially offline systems and how we can create uh, naturalised features um, that are kind of uh, will become part of the landscape. And so they're working on the, these designs currently and we're hoping to get some of these designs back in the coming weeks, which will inform our feasibility investigations further. And I will quickly hand off over to you. Great, thank you so much, Ben. Hopefully that just shows you the incredible amount of work that's been going in this year, collating these species, the species data, getting a really understanding of the health of the ecosystem that currently finds itself at Solwood Court Farm. I think one thing as Ben was going through all those different species, each species has a story to tell. Uh, and of course, wildlife doesn't have mouths. So I think it's our job to try and tell the stories of these species to show you how amazing they truly are and help to inspire people about some of the amazing natural uh, natural world and natural sort of stories that are playing out on our doorsteps that some of us might not realise. I think one species to me typifies this more than any other species that we've recorded this, this year at Tolworth Court Farm. It was actually a species new to me. I learned all about it. Thank you to Dan from the Field Studies Council who gave me a, a great insight to beetle uh, ecology but this is one this species in particular is called a tortoise beetle it's called a tortoise beetle because in its adult stage it has amazing exoskeleton shell that looks almost exactly like a tortoise but on a very miniature scale but what before the tortoise gets into its adult tortoise shape it's a larva and, uh, and this is this small picture here at the bottom there is, is, is a larva of a tortoise beetle and obviously tortoise beetles as a larva like many larva is very very vulnerable to predation um, 
being eaten by a bird or another invertebrate potentially. So obviously it's evolved a way in which it can try and protect itself, to so stop itself being eaten. And the way in which it's done this, in this case, I think is one of the most incredible evolutionary protective mechanisms that the animal world can potentially ever come up with. And this large structure that you can see on top of this small little larva beetle here, it's actually what we call a fecal shield. And so it's actually created a, a, effectively a giant turd, a, the size of itself. So it carries around and waggles above its head. And that just tries to discourage anything eating it. And I think these stories are just amazing. They're happening all the time. People just don't know about them. So I think it's our role as educators and conservationists to try and tell people about these amazing stories that are unfolding beneath our feet and that we don't know about it. And how can we, if we don't know about something, how can we care about it? So I hope a big part of this is raising awareness amongst the community. So Ben, if you just jump to the next slide. Um, so over the last sort of year or so, we've been doing lots of uh, stuff to try and raise awareness for the, the, the amazing natural heritage that we have on Tol in Tolworth. And this is a picture from uh, actually a, pre, uh, a few years ago when we had a little event on site, just promoting the local wildlife. But it's so important that people are the heart of our project here. People are what make you know, Tollworth special. So we need to make sure that people are reflected and, they're, and they can use this site in a respectful way. And, uh, and it becomes a really important social asset. And getting the opinions and engaging with local people to hear about how you would like to see the site develop and become in, the, in, in years to come is going to be incredibly important as we try and co-create this vision together to create, create a truly outstanding nature reserve. So if you Ben, just jump on to the next one for me, if that's OK. So over the course of the last year, we've been trying to do as much sort of local engagement as possible. We've been using the fantastic venue, which is the Corner House Theatre in Tolworth. We've run two fantastic events there we're getting local people to come listen to about what we do with the project and ask questions the last one we did sold out we had about 100 people in the auditorium which was fantastic and it was a really positive event getting people from all walks of life all different backgrounds into this room together as we can try and celebrate our natural heritage together and try and aspire for to become an even better place uh, when it comes to uh, nature conservation uh, thanks very much to the next one for me and we've also been doing lots of engagement on site. So over the course of the summer, we'll be doing lots of, let alone the sort of community ecological surveys that Ben was talking about. We've been doing other things like uh, nature walks in uh, through the summer meadows, which are fantastic. And, and literally hundreds of people out to try and explore this site and help them interpret it in a way they might have never known before. Uh, so here we can see the fantastic barn that's at the Moated Manor site and it provides a fantastic venue to try and educate people and use it almost like as a mini outdoor lecture theatre to tell people about the amazing wildlife that we have living around us. And we also did a, a lovely bat walk which had about 50 people on it as we went out into the night sky looking for bats which was fantastic. It's just great to see local people engaging and interested uh, and, uh, and wanting to learn more about the wildlife that we have here. But it's not just about um, uh, uh, pure ecology. So Ben, if you jump to the next one, it's also about trying to inspire people and nature and art go together in so many ways. And, you know, so much of art is inspired creativity and the community brain who uh, have lot this year uh, did a fantastic garden at the Hampton Court Flower Show. And this garden was inspired by the wildlife of Tolworth Court Farm and how that wildlife can help to uh, uh, encourage people to create music and, uh, and uh, do some really fantastic arty things. Um, and I think it was an amazing garden. It was and we're engaging local schools and also a local composer who is a well-known local composer actually went out into Tolworth Court Farm in the early morning, recorded the bird songs and created this most beautiful composition, uh, which I'm sure we can share, uh, which we, yeah, it really is a truly, truly fantastic musical feat. And yeah, and yeah, so a really fantastic element the community brain have been leading on. I'm sure Robin and Charlie can elaborate that if you have any questions at the end. Uh, but yeah, Ben, if you jump on to the next one for me. We've also been trying to get as many children involved as possible. So we're organising school trips to come to the site. But not only that, we'd be renting out um, Tolworth Library on Tolworth High Street. And every Thursday evening for the last sort of seven weeks, we've been running a rewilding rangers programme where local children come at 4.30 after school. And I teach them about things from water bowls to castle and, they, they, and, and they're learning all about the amazing wildlife that we, we, are, we have around us. But not only teaching them about wildlife, teaching them how to become um, sort of 
guardians of nature and stewards of, of nature in the future. And it has been really amazing. I found it a truly amazing experience myself, just meeting these sort of nine, well, eight to 11 year olds who are just truly inspirational people and are learning so much and, and, a great, and it's been a great experience. And we're gonna be doing these sessions now every, every first Thursday of the month moving forward. So if you have a child between, well, wow, between sort of seven to 11, bring them down to Tolworth Library on Thursday, the first Thursday of the month and, and, and it'd be great to get them doing one of our nature sessions and yeah it really is great to try and be inspiring the next generation of, of people who care about nature which of course is so important and if you jump to the next one for me Ben but of course as I've been trying as I hope you try and got, get from, from all this community engagement we really want to hear from as many people as possible to get your views about how you would like to see this site become how you use the site already and you know just to get your your, your, your views your concerns potentially or opportunities that we might not have thought of so we can put it all in one big melting pot and come up together with a, a plan that we've all, all co-designed together so this survey is live we go uh, we can we will share that the, the link is readily available uh, we can we can send um um, actually, the community brain have just put in the chat, uh, Charlie, thank you, Charlie, for putting the, the, the survey form there. So you can access our online survey there uh, and give your views about the project. And this will be open uh, until the end of November. So you've got lots of time to try and scribble down your views. And we do, please do tell your friends to do it as well, just so we get as, as broad an input as possible. We've had over 100, 100, well, over 100 responses already, but we'd love some more. So thank you to those who've done it. And if you haven't done it, please do it. And then please tell your friends about it. Uh, ben, if you jump to the next one for me, please. Cool. So, again, hopefully, just to sort of take a sort of a, 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 a sort of a, a, a sort of conclusion point to some extent. Hope all of these elements, the feasibility work, the ecology work, that community consultation work, will help us to create a revised management plan. The last one was done in 2003 and wasn't really enacted very much. Uh, so we're hopefully going to create this new vision that is based on leading science, conservation experts, and also the community voice and we can come up with this truly uh, hopefully a pioneering plan for the site to have a um, outstanding nature reserve that we can all be proud of and showcase to other people across uh, London and urban realms about how we can have a truly functional ecosystem in a um, uh, urban space or relatively urban space uh, which is a really exciting thing and trying to create a roadmap of how we might be able to achieve that moving forward. Um, so Ben if you just jump to the next one for me I just thought we would um, uh, conclude this talk um, on some of the potential future species that could be considered in the future management of the site as i say none of this is confirmed it's all about how we sort of propose it so please yeah we want to hear your views about this but the first one ben if you click to the next one is we already use cattle to great effect on on on, on 12 court farm moated manor uh, cows have got an amazing long tongue they haven't got top teeth so they wrap their tongue around long grass and create an amazing patchwork of um uh, of, of, of sward structure which enables wild uh, wildflowers to colonize and we've got to remember before we domesticated cattle they were a, like an absolutely essential part of our ecosystem a functional ecosystem uh, something called the aura could roam our forests and our woodlands and also our grasslands and their impact on that space in a low density has a really important ecological role something that many people have forgotten but cows have an incredibly important ecological role and without them the the landscape will be denuded uh, ben if you jump to the next one for me please Another fantastic species are pigs. Pigs are analogues of, of, of wild boar. Obviously, before we domesticated pigs, we'd had wild boar. They'd be running around woodlands. And the best thing about pigs, they have this incredible cartilage ring around their, 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 their nose. And what that does, it helps to they, uh, for, they, they dig up things like tubers and earthworms. And as they dig up small parts of ground, they disturb it. And that, that disturbance enables um, other species to colonize and creates that dynamic ecosystem that I was talking about. So these are really keystone species. That potentially one day we could have uh, for a small amount of time, we wouldn't say they'd be there all year round, but for a few weeks potentially, we could potentially have pigs doing, doing their really important ecological behavior Tower Court Farm, which would be a really great example. And in rural context, they used a good effect at the moment. So we know it has strong ecological science behind it. Ben, if you jump to the next one for me, please. And white storks. So white storks are an amazing species. The last time they bred, bred, bred was hundreds of years ago, actually, the time of the Battle of Agincourt. That's when white storks last bred in the UK. But over the last five years or so, there have been some fantastic reintroduction projects of white stork within, 
within within the English context. Um, and as a species, uh, within conservation, they're used as a symbol of hope, ecological regeneration, and they have so much fascination about them. They, in urban centres across Europe, they're found roosting on chimneys and stuff, and people actually love having them as these symbols of nature in their in, in their more urbanised environments. And it might sound strange, we actually have white storks that are actually um, occasionally fly over Surbiton and Tolworth as we speak. Uh, due to reintroductions that have taken place. And these birds aren't very clever, so they're looking for other bird populations where they might be able to want to settle down and uh, potentially create a nest. So we thought we might try and see if we can actively encourage that. And because they're not very clever birds, well, we could try and trick them by painting a plastic heron that you might have by your pond um, to scare away uh, birds, uh, scare away things from eating your fish and um, put it on a, a pole and, that, and then paint a sort of white ring around the platform that you've erected and that will that white that white ring will have, it will be sort of the the, the it, sort of pretending to be the poo that the, the the white storks are making, and hopefully that might then encourage white storks that are flying over the way to sort of settle down, have a look at Tolworth, and say, well, maybe this could be a home for me in the future. We've actually got a student from next university who's his master's student. He's, he's actually done his thesis on this, and we're waiting for that and looking forward to reading that when we get it. But potentially it could be an amazing species that, um, uh, uh, that could be inhabiting Tolworth at some point in the future. Who knows? And the last species I want to tell you about, if you go to the next slide for me, Ben, is uh, glowworm. And glowworms are amazing beetles. Uh, they're not worms at all. And they actually say so they're, they're the female beetle that you can see here. I think there's no other species in the, in, in the UK that characterizes magic and the magic of nature as much as a glowworm. So these females here, uh, they glow in the summertime to attract the males that can fly. They only glow for a very short amount of time, but that is all to attract a male to come and mate with them. But, they, but walking through a meadow at night time with glowing glowworms, there can be very few other sort of na natural experiences that engender that, that feel of magic and just the, the awe and majesty of the natural world. So who knows, maybe one day in the future we could have white stalks clattering above our heads and glowworms glowing in our meadows as we enjoy the, the ecosystem that Tolworth might, want, might one day be able to provide. So that's to give you a small indication of some of the stuff we might be able to do moving forward. Um, but thank you, Ben, on to the next one. So um, that, that brings us to the end of our presentation. Apologies, I probably went on a bit longer than we intended. I tend, we tend to get more excited, too excited and talk for too long. So sorry about that. But we now, we now have time for questions. So and we do, Elliot. I've got a couple of questions that have come in while that was going on, which I'll uh, read out if that's all right for you two to answer. Yeah, uh, one came up while we were looking at the potential for the wetlands area and the flood allevi alleviation there. And the question from Liz was, what about the sewage overflow? I suggest that would be a more important to improve. Yes, absolutely. So uh, anybody who knows Tolworth Court Farm, there is on there is infrastructure underground. Uh, so sort of, there is a, 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 a foul sewer. There's also a gas pipe, and also obviously the overhead pylons. And actually, the the, the foul sewer does actually run close to where the uh, wetland could be established. Um, obviously. It's very, very, uh, in a, very much in the public domain and, and very much a, sort of a big news story at the moment of how many of our rivers are polluted, um, which is a real problem, not only our rivers, our seas, so it really is a big issue that we need to face as a, as a society. Um, so I hope for the one thing, if, if we create a wetland, there's a functional wetland, um, well, what that can do, that can help to actually not only create a really biodiverse system, also create a, a system that um, can store more water to prevent from flood risk, uh, flood, flood, flood risk, but also it can help to clean our water through a filtration system as the macrophytes, the, the plants, the oxygenators create this filter bed process and that can actually help clean the water. But, um, uh, but as I say, there's, there, there is a history of, 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 of rag escaping the sort of sewage there, which is actually horrid. So I think we would want to work with Thames Water moving forward to improve the infrastructure there to make sure that, you know, that that doesn't, that, you know, we, 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 we can try and resolve that sewage situation, which is obviously not very good. Also, we have our, the outfalls up by uh, one of the bridges. And um, you'll see an outfall there, which, which can be sometimes polluting. So, um, yeah, I think obviously it's a very important thing that we try and resolve from working with, you know, statutory bodies like the Environment Agency and water companies, Thames Water. Uh, but I think, you know, uh, 
creating a functional wetland can be a small part of trying to help improve our water quality moving forward. And if we can design a system that, um, uh, that works on site, that would be fantastic. But I, I definitely take the point that... Um, it's, okay. it's We've got a few more questions flooding in, which is really funny. Um, <laughs> I use flooding. Um, so the next one came up fairly early on in the presentation. Please don't think about putting cattle on these fields. Dogs run across the fields every day. There are many dog walkers that use these fields and have done for years. It's the only safe place locally for them. Uh, ben, do you want to jump on that first and then I can... Yeah, so there's a couple of things. So at System Z, we've been we've been working well, we've we've launched a project on, on dog walk engagement. Um, and the premise behind that project is to get dog walkers to engage other dog walkers um, in, in nature friendly dog walking behaviors. Um, and as part of that, what we've been doing is a lot of uh, wildlife walks. So getting people to come out with their dogs, um, experience the wildlife locally learn about potential kind of conflicts with wildlife and ways that you can overcome that. Um, it's been a really productive way of kind of having um, you know, proactive conversations around potential areas of, of yeah, areas of conflict and ways that you can reduce that. Um, so one of the things that we'd like to do on site is potentially scaling that up and doing that around commerce and thinking about how we can um, kind of manage that. Um, but for me personally as well, I, I'm a dog walker as well, so I, I definitely don't want to discourage people from walking dogs on site, but it might just be that going forward there's an element of change into the way that that's done and you know, at certain times of year it might be dogs on leads um, and just trying, kind of changing some of the behaviours potentially if there was going to be capital on site. But again, these are very much early conversations, so it's great to get um, kind of feedback in that sort of area because it's it's something that we want we want to make sure that we're we're taking on and incorporating that into any future management um, going forward. Yeah, absolutely. I think one thing to say we don't want to exclude anybody from this project or this site. So obviously, I think one of the main users of the site at the moment, almost certainly the dog walkers. So we will, uh, as a Ben, as a dog walker himself, can, can relate to that as well himself. Um, so we want to work with people to encourage nature-friendly dog walking and how you can maybe enjoy the site uh, with your dog. And if you will do want to sort of run your dog off lead, obviously there are potentially other opportunities. You know, we, on the other side of Jubilee Meadows, uh, there's called King George's Playing Field as well, which is has, has nowhere near the ecological value of this site. So if the dog just wants to run around, catch a ball, run around as crazy and do, do the exhaust himself or herself i think jubilee uh, you know uh, king george's playing field is a fantastic place for that and if you want to take more of a walk with your dog and enjoy nature mm -hmm. then do it with, uh, in a more responsible but more, more ecologically friendly way uh, the top Court farm will certainly be open to that as well um so it's not about excluding anyone and we've got from isabel do you think there are any opportunities and risks with the signal park development nearby lots more potential users of the space um, does anybody actually like, I start with that? Does anybody else want to jump on with that? Or I, well, I, I'll, I'll jump in and people can try and watch, join in. Of course, we recognise that there's a lot of development pressure in the local area, especially Signal Park, of all the homes that's associated with that. And, you know, the, 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 the little development of the workers there as well. So I think one thing we, we really want to encourage with this site, and I think one of its most exciting things is also one of its most sort of challenging things. It's the people that live around it. And uh, obviously that creates incredible opportunities for us to create an environment where you can walk around and engage in a nature rich space uh, and sort of, sort of, you know, challenge perceptions, how we can have these more functional ecosystems in an urban environment that can bring all those positive um, things that we spoke about. Uh, but of course, increased pressure will bring, you know, increased people to the site will also increase pressures to the site. So we want to sort of, you know, working with the community brain, Kingston University, we want to try and create a way in which we can engage and encourage responsible usership of the site. So, for example, we want to, with the entrance ways, we want to sort of call them gateways. So as you walk into the site, you recognise how special the site is that you're walking into and sort of setting the tone, encouraging more nature friendly, more responsible behaviours. And by having like a series of really well constructed paths and sort of 
interpretation elements and potentially viewing platforms, encouraging people to use the site um, in, in sort of ways that can have limited impacts to the surrounding wildlife. So there's loads of examples across Europe and the UK about how we can try and create these nature rich environments that have high levels of people use. Uh, and then do it in a way that minimizes that impact to wildlife. But certainly it's one of our biggest challenges, but one of our greatest opportunities here, I think, to really show how we can uh, make it such a great place to rewild people. Um, is there anything else you want to add, Robin or Ben, on to that? No, I think you've caught it that in the end of it, you know, a, a popular space, and we hope this will be popular, brings its own issues, but actually how it is managed and how it's made available will help mitigate against a lot of the dangers that it could cause and I think it will boil down to respect and a lot of the antisocial behavior and a lot of the issues we've had in the past is because people have perceived it as a neglected area or a forgotten area it's almost given permission for that sort of behavior when it is actually being cared for and looked after uh, and really promoted as that it will hopefully uh, encourage uh, the adoption of better uh, standards around it. We've got a question from Phil and he's added an addendum, well comment uh, and an addendum to it is um, suggest the digging of a number of ponds within the site in addition to just the wetland creation uh, and then adds if ponds are created they will need fencing as dogs and ponds don't mix. Yeah, it's a, really, it's a really good point. Um, it is something that as part of the wetland feasibility investigations that we are looking into. Um, part of those kind of topographical studies done across the site, we're basically looking at potential areas where we could put smaller ponds in. Um, and this is also kind of going on from the, the, the last management plan from back in 2003, there um, some wider ambitions for more kind of wetland creation across the site. And it's definitely something that we, we would look to, to kind of uh, replicate or uh, more than going forward. But again, it's a suggestion that if you do the questionnaire, please, the survey, please put it in there. Um, and then we have uh, an, uh, Somak who says, can I volunteer in the rewilding projects? I have experience in GIS and R-based connectivity analysis, and I'm also open to other types of re rewilding tasks. Um, and what we can do, uh, Somak, is put our email address in the chat area so if you want to email that request then we can make sure that you're in our list of people who would like to support it absolutely just to, just to add to that point there's so many ways to involve engage with this project so please do yeah it'd be great to have you on board you know when i did my masters many years ago there's one thing i couldn't hate more was oh, i actually couldn't deal with it so we need people who have that sort of technical analysis and knowledge of gis systems and you know we're also trying to work with you know, kingston university other universities to try and potentially even do research projects we want this to be a space of learning as well as a space of engagement so there'll be so many i uh, hopefully sort of potentially good research questions that can come out of this uh, one thing that we didn't say this is actually on the rewilding britain map now of urban of, of rewilding sites that we haven't in the uk and a lot of these rewilding sites have been great places where universities have sent their students to and created some fantastic um, research papers demonstrating how we can restore nature in this time of ecological collapse and uh, 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 and we are the first urban project to be listed on that network which is a really which we think is a really exciting thing so there will certainly be opportunities to use that a uh, very very <laughs> skill set that you have there so please do engage mm. And Helen, with quite a sad one, I haven't been in the fields for a long while since I had an incident with a motorcyclist. Have they moved on? I'm really sorry to hear you had that sad incident. Um, I think one thing to recognise the site, especially at some night times, there can be potential issues with things like motorbikes and quad bikes and, and, uh, and create sometimes what can be quite uh, an intimidating atmosphere which is, it feels like something you might have experienced yourself so really sorry to hear that happen but one thing that we hope through redesigning the entrances stopping access for those sort of vehicles to cause carnage and mess around and you know create a potentially threatening atmosphere and also ecological damage uh, we're hoping to combat those sort of antisocial behaviors so um, certainly it's something that still not not regularly happens but sometimes happens on the site but hopefully this project will help to combat exactly what you experienced to make it very feel a very safe space that you can enjoy without without feeling well, fear of being here. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Elliot. We've got a couple of questions still to go. 
Um, Nick says the Bonesgate stream suffers heavy silt runoff after heavy rain from upstream farms, particularly during the winter. How would this potentially impact on the proposed wetland area? Um, ben, do you want to jump on this one? Yeah, so that's a great question. Um, and it's something you know, we're looking into, well, we're trying to learn from other projects really that have done this successfully. So there's a really pioneering one in Norfolk uh, that was launched, I think a year or so ago. Uh, where they're re-diverting incredibly polluted water into a series of, of wetland features or habitats um, and by planting the right plant communities essentially those plants will then suck up all of that all of the the, the pollutants and actually fixate it and use it as a, as a growing um, kind of uh, as growing nutrients so what we'd like to do is really it will take quite a lot of um, research into kind of what uh, potential pollutants are in the, those um, sediments the thinking about what plant communities we could put in place that might have a benefit, beneficial impact in terms of filtering off the pollutants and, and in turn having a, a beneficial impact on that ecosystem in itself. Yeah, and to quickly add on to that, so I think um, uh, South East Rivers Trust, a local fantastic organisation, do lots of um, uh, uh, sort of river improvements across the borough, improving fish passage and such like, and then combating invasive species. Um, they are actively now, I believe, in trying to engage as much as possible with Park Farm and Russet Farm, which are a real source of agricultural runoff into the Bones Gate, which does cause issues for the hogs mill. So I think that, so this, this if we could create a live wetland system that can follow the historic path of how the river used to flow here before we to try to straighten it and spend all that money to destroy a functional ecosystem, but now we can try and recover that. As Ben would say, we could bring that ecological function back to the site potentially, but also I think you need a holistic sort of um, uh, strategic approach where we're also trying to engage with those farm owners and try and stop the polluting activity in the first place as well. Um, and finally, from Julian, can there be toilet facilities there or nearby that don't impact badly but make it great to visit by bus, train, cycle, etc.? Um, yeah, so I think infrastructure is going to be so important to the site. One thing we have at the Moated Manor site is, um, I think, one of the poshest compost toilets in town. Um, so there are there are opportunities for us to, you know, you know, and that can actually have a positive ecological impact. So, so I think, yeah, that sort of infrastructure is very important. Of course, the the community brain with the the, the hub at Tolworth Station has infrastructure as well which is very close so I think it's utilizing the existing infrastructure and seeing what we can create that isn't going to damage the ecologies and just you know, make it a more accessible site. Brilliant well that oh sorry uh, from Phil uh, educate the farmers to sow winter crops to minimize topsoil erosion. Oh, hey Phil <laughs> uh, yeah absolutely yeah I think yeah yeah um, and yeah, Phil and Nick, I'm sure, have got lots of knowledge in that space as well. So yeah, if you could, you know, come do, do our surveys, uh, 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 that would be that'd be great. And uh, uh, so, uh, and put, put it all down there. But I think one, 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 one little thing I want to add, we're actually talking to uh, uh, Natural England and we're talking to uh, Surrey, Epsom Renewal Council, uh, and seeing is there potential to look at the whole landscape as a bigger picture? And we're actually saying like Ashdead Common, Horton Park, Horton Country Park, obviously the Bonesgate there, we're having very early discussions around, can we actually have a new na national nature reserve that embodies all this space that would enable these conversations to really take place for, take place in a bit more strategic fashion. So yeah, we're definitely thinking wide about how we could uh, have those conversations. Um, we are sort of just slightly over time, but another question in from Sonak. Are there any strategies being explored to reduce littering in the area? Yeah, so just quickly on that. So there's kind of two parts to, to, to answer that. Um, the first of which being, well, one of the ways that we're kind of combating that issue at the moment is through community cleanup. So we're actually doing a litter pick on the 15th of December, which anyone would be more than welcome to join. So a Christmas cleanup are we doing. But in terms of trying to reduce the actual litter in the first place, what we're really hoping is this project in itself and kind of raising the profile of the site, increasing its um, the way it's perceived as a community asset, we hope will kind of instill those positive behavioural changes to, to reduce the, the impact of litter on the site. We think by having what Elliot mentioned earlier, having those kind of gateways to the site that can you know, talk about different um, uh, the uh, ecological value and all the rest of it, 
build its profile, hopefully instill that kind of um, you know, people's value of the site to, to prevent that happening in the first place. That's fantastic. Thank you both. Um, and thank you to everybody who's uh, come and joined in this evening. Um, we hope that you have enjoyed it. And uh, the key that I think was said by Elliot fairly early on, this is not about the decisions that have been made. This is about the discussions that are being had. And uh, again, in the chat there, there's the link to the survey and to the email that you can get hold of and to the date and times for that litter pick on uh, the 15th of December. Uh, but I'll just uh, allow Elliot and Ben a moment, just if there's anything that they'd like to say at this point before we close down the meeting. Yeah, well, again, just to reiterate, Robin's thanks to everyone for joining. And this recording, this, this session this evening has been recorded. So if you know somebody uh, who might be interested in, in listening to this because they use the site or, or uh, you know, you think it might be of value to them, uh, this recording will be available. So we do ask that you also maybe share this around. So uh, anybody else you think would like to listen, that would be really appreciated too. Yeah, and just one final thing from me, just to say, it's been an absolute pleasure working with so many local members of the community on this project today. And we really see this as the start of the journey and we're so excited to have you on board with us as we develop it into the future. So thank you all very much. Uh, I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you enjoy the rest of your evening. Um, and Charlie, if you can close us down, that would be brilliant. Thank you.